welcome to uh, DCU for this special occasion. In fact, it's a double celebration. We're both marking International Women's Day and we're also unveiling five magnificent portraits as part of Accenture's Women and Walls project here at DCU. It's an important milestone uh, on the journey of the university. The magnificent portraits obviously reflect our strength in the STEM disciplines. But more important than that, they're an important statement of the university's commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion. These magnificent portraits celebrate five uh, trailblazers, women who led the way and pushed out the boundaries in their disciplines and often in very difficult circumstances. Um, not only were they eminent uh, scientists and uh, engineers, but what was striking in terms of the selection is the number of these women who were uh, curious, uh, they were engaged, and they were also very socially conscious. Uh, our mission at DCU is to transform lives and societies, and these five subjects celebrated in this series certainly did that. They will have pride of place uh, in the short term in the foyer of our engineering and computing building and in time they will be moved to our flagship future tech building when uh, it's complete when that happens of course we'll be delighted to welcome you all back to dcu for a welcome in person we are committed uh, at dcu to gender equality and through our women in leadership program that we have moved to address the historic imbalances. We have, for instance, renamed two of our facilities in honour of two of the subjects of the Women and Walls series, um, Kay McNulty and Kathleen Lonsdale. We've also made very significant moves to address the imbalance in terms of the representation of women at senior grades at the professoriate within the university. We're not there yet, but we are on our way and we're pleased too to have been awarded our second Athena Swan Bronze Award. Uh, of course, uh, diversity and inclusion involve more than gender. And we're very pleased that two of the subjects chosen for these series are women of colour. And they too will stand uh, as an example and an invitation to the increasing demographic variety that we enjoy here at DCU. The sense that they are welcome and the invitation here is for them to excel. I'd like to thank all those who contributed to make this dream of Women in Walls at DCU a reality. I'd especially like to thank our colleagues at Accenture for their incredible support for this stimulating partnership. There is a great friendship between DCU and Accenture and we work on so many projects together. But in this regard, I'd especially like to thank uh, Dr. Michelle Cullen, a proud graduate uh, of DCU who's managing director at Accenture and who leads their inclusion and diversity. We couldn't have achieved this either without the support of business to arts and the professional management of the project from beginning to end. Uh, and in that context I'd like to thank uh, Andrew Heddington, the CEO of Business to Arts and all his colleagues and the corporate supporters uh, for their support and involvement uh, in this project. I'd also like to give a big shout out to my predecessor, Professor Breen McCrae, who initiated this project. Uh, and here on the ground, our wonderful Marcella Bannon, the arts officer at DCU, uh, who led the project from within. Uh, finally, I'd like again to thank the magnificent artists, but especially to pay homage to the, the scientists, to the five women uh, who by their example have uh, called out to us to choose to challenge uh, and that uh, clarion will go out to uh, generations of students and women who cross these portals of the university. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome again to this uh, virtual launch. Thank you Dara. For Accenture's Women on Walls at DCU we received 57 submissions to the open call in early 2020. And as is standard with this commission, we were extremely impressed with the overall quality and diversity of the submissions we received. 
the assessment panel had the difficult task of identifying the five artists that were selected, who are Breed higgins Nikanade, Jackie hudson Lawler, Una Seeley, Jim Fitzpatrick and Blay Smith. Throughout 2020, the artists worked to complete their portraits by researching each of their chosen subjects and, where possible, building relationships with their families and with experts in the disciplines of each of the subjects. In the five portraits unveiled, you can see the attention to detail represented within the symbols in each of the portraits. For example, in Breed Higgins Nikonage's portrait of Marie Maynard Daly, you will see a heart positioned on a bench which is a symbol of her groundbreaking work identifying the impact of a high cholesterol diet. In Jackie Hudson Lawler's case, the portrait of Catherine Johnson has a mathematical equation in the golden ratio on the blackboard behind her. This represents her exceptional contribution to mathematics and to orbital mechanics. While the past year has had many challenges for this edition of Women on Walls, the portraits created are outstanding and represent the very unique styles of each of our artists. Commissioning new art like this is one of the ways to support the art sector during the pandemic. And now at Business to Arts, we believe it is vital that we make such investments in our arts community. Accenture's Women on Walls at DCU is a landmark art commission and it will inspire generations of students at DCU. This is a fitting follow-on to the Women on Walls campaigns at the Royal Irish Academy and at RCSI, and we are excited to be unveiling this edition of the campaign today on International Women's Day. I'd like to thank everyone at Accenture and at DCU and the five artists for their determination and their commitment to this commission. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Dara. Coming together virtually to mark Women on Walls at DCU on this International Women's Day is very special. I can vividly remember the first time that I stepped off the 19A bus and walked up the avenue at 16 years of age to attend an open day in the Henry Grattan building. And listening as people described the communications course, it was magic. It was such an innovative mix of technology, statistics, communication skills training, all combined with the humanities. And I was hooked, imagining what it would be like to go there and how that would shape my path in life. And now, thanks to technology, here I am again, back virtually in DCU in these most unusual times. It seems a long time since the original Women on Walls began at Accenture with Alistair Blair, Ethna Harley and myself working with the great collaboration with the Royal Irish Academy in 2016, and then the equally wonderful collaboration with RCSI two years later. Now, this is a Women on Walls unveiling like no other, but we're reminded now, perhaps more than ever, of the need for diversity of thought, of learning and of experience in an ever-changing world. Many times since the, in the years since I've graduated from DCU, I've been reminded of how innovation happens at the intersection of different disciplines and different perspectives. And what has stayed with me from the communications course is to think critically and to look below the surface it's not just the information that's presented, but to always question what's missing. Because what's unsaid is where a lot of communication happens. And noticing who's excluded from the picture is where we need to focus. Women and Walls began in response to the simple question, where are the women? And so often we find that the answer is the women were there, but their work, their achievements, their innovation is less celebrated and perhaps less likely to be preserved for future generations. And so the stories of the women being recognised today in DCU are inspiring stories of accomplishment across the sciences, technology, engineering and maths. An Accenture research report from 2019, What Now for STEM, found that gender imbalance remains an issue with little or no change in the number of girls taking on and pursuing STEM careers in recent years. So putting portraits of women on walls is so important to honour trailblazers. Women like Beatrice Alice Hicks, Catherine Johnson, Dame Kathleen Lonsdale, Marie Maynard Daly and Kay McNulty. And this year we're also launching a new digital platform created to inspire and engage the next generation in areas of STEM. DCU gave me the best start in life and I'm so proud to be an old alumna of this young university. The thinking, the research, challenging and supporting start that students get here is much needed in the world. 
And I'm excited to think of all the future generations who will come to DCU Open Days, unsure of their path, but who might be inspired to imagine what it will be like to go there and how it will shape their path in life. So even though we're not yet able to physically be together to see the portraits on the walls of DCU, we're very excited to share with you the journey of the portraits from conception to completion in this short documentary. And after this, we're going to hear from journalist, broadcaster and fellow alumna DCU, uh, Dervil MacDonald, speaking with our five artists to discuss the portraits and their journey over the past year. So on behalf of all of us here at Accenture, a huge thanks to the artists, to DCU, to Business to Arts and to the many other organisations who've said that they're inspired by Women on Walls, and especially to all those who teach and inspire our young people. This is for you. Catherine is such an extraordinary person. She didn't let too much of the segregation and the black and white issue. That wasn't her life. Maths was everything for her. So for her to uh, prevail as an engineer in such a male industry as well, or science, was extraordinary. I mean, her own father didn't want her to do it, and she defied him. She was not just a hugely groundbreaking and important scientist, but she was also a activist in a couple of areas which were just as important a part of her life as her science career. Some of the work she did really affects public health today and stuff that we all understand, such as the effects of smoking and um, cholesterol on heart disease. She had a role in uh, helping the American military win a war, a real war against fascism and Nazism was extraordinary and for a woman to be in that position of kind of scientific prowess and power was extraordinary. She was a teacher, a uh, mathematical teacher, and then she had her family and she sat at home and married her family. And it wasn't until her 40s that she heard of the opportunity in NASA looking for what they call female computers. At this time, she was also a widow wearing three daughters, so she had a lot on her, on her hands. So she got the job, she went into the, the black female computing wing and she was there a week and one of the engineers came and said I need uh, some people to help with this particular project and Catherine was chosen. The basic thing was she was meant to be on loan, she was meant to be just for a short amount of time to get what they needed done and then she would go back to the female computing wing but she never went back, they kept her. A woman like Kay McNulty, right, she's all smiles, I'd know from looking at her you don't mess with her. Do you know what I mean? She has very bright, vivacious eyes, and they're kind eyes. My mother didn't take nonsense, didn't take prisoners, you know what I mean? And I'd say she's the same. If she had to get a job done triangulating where the enemy was and calculating the speed of a shell, because that was one of her jobs, I wouldn't like to be at the other end of it, put it that way. You know? <laughs> Marie Maynard Daly has done some amazing work. First of all, she's quite well known as the first African-American woman to get a PhD in chemistry. Also, her work on protein synthesis was cited by Watson and Crick when they received the Nobel Prize um, for creating the DNA double helix structure. But more importantly, some of the work she did really affects public health today and stuff that we all understand, such as the effects of smoking and um, cholesterol on heart disease. So some of these things are very tangible for us all. What I found most interesting about Kathleen Lonsdale was that she was not just a hugely groundbreaking and important scientist, but she was also a activist. So although she, uh, she discovered the molecular structure of the benzene ring, which was a completely pioneering and groundbreaking piece of work, but she also was a, uh, she was a lifelong pacifist and she was an author. 
I think, I think apart from being an engineering innovator, she uh, was an advocate for women. She, in her later life, she worked with women in countries outside the US, such as Mexico and South America, to help them move forward in business and so on, and also to be engineers and, uh, and so on. So she was a real advocate for women in her industry. You know, but for me, uh, what was very striking was I looked at a lot of footage, looking for imagery basically, around the Apollo 11 launch. And there was an incredible amount of men in all this footage. And in fact, if you looked at the videos that I was looking at, and you were an alien looking down on Earth in 1968, you'd think there were no women at all. The world that Beatrice Hicks was in was incredibly male-dominated. For, so for her to... Uh, uh, prevail as an engineer in such a male industry as well, or science, was extraordinary. I mean, her own father didn't want her to do it and she defied him. The fact that I could, uh, you know, learn about the subject, Kay McNulty, the fact that I could talk to her daughter, Ginny, it all made it an interesting process, you know. But the most important thing is, it's getting back to the original purpose of all this. It's to bring outstanding women who we've not heard about to the fore. You know, I only heard about Kay McNulty two years ago. I think it's really important for future generations to be able to see that the important people we hang on walls don't all look the same that there's a variety of people who've made great achievements and who've contributed to the knowledge we have today. I think it's really important for young people, uh, boys and girls, to see role models that are female, um, and particularly uh, women of colour. As an artist, it is a major opportunity to produce a, a, you know, an important piece of work that will be hanging in a collection that will create its own legacy. It's like you could kind of, I mean part of me starts getting really angry about it but on the other hand like I'm just so happy to be part of the solution and you know there's just such a, an, an impetus now going forward that this situation is not going to arise again. You know jumping way ahead here but that students, women and girls will see that their gender is getting those accolades, being, you know, honoured and uh, hung in, the, in these national collections. It is a really important mission that this painting is part of, which is to make women visible in all walks of life. And to uh, allow them to have roles um, that are not predetermined by the patriarchy, <laughs> which is true. So luckily for me, I wasn't too adversely affected by the pandemic. I wanted to make this painting accessible and fresh and something that would be understood by young students in DCU and so I thought that the setting of the lab would be appropriate for Marie Maynard Daly but also for the setting where the painting is intended for. And I like the idea of um, this figure backlit by the big window uh, with light shining all around her. I wanted uh, this to sort of symbolise her general openness and generosity and how she made a legacy for students who came after her. Because I've never met her and I don't know her, um, there are a lot of questions. So to, to go online initially and to look at photographs of her from the past and the present, and then to find videos of her speaking in interviews, to find articles written about her. I also downloaded her biography 
plus the book Hidden Figures, which is a lot more detailed, obviously, than the film. So in terms of, of the painting itself, it was important. I wanted to portray her in a way that I felt that she would be happy with, that her family would be happy with. So everything in the painting from her clothing, her stance um, and the background came from the research. Um, in the fact of her being a, a mathematician, using the golden ratio in the background and one of the equations that she had written, um, which I took from the film. You know, the painting does what I intended it to do. It makes her look really strong and powerful. It also means that when somebody looks at this painting or sees this painting, they go, what are they all looking at? That's what they're going to think. They're going to think, well, what, what, where are all these people looking? And then they're going to go, who is she? What, what is she doing? So I think it'll draw people into it and they'll come over and they'll go, you know, what is, what's this about? Because there's a whole lot of unanswered questions in, you know, the narrative of what's going on in this image. Why are they all holding binoculars? Where are they looking? What's going on? I wanted it to look like a real room in a real place. And uh, so I referring to, I'm referencing furniture of the time and an interior that is alluding to University College London where she was a professor. When I thought I was finished, I thought, oh, it was just a bit flat, so out I went on the balcony again. More painting thrown at it, more texture. And then I thought, now it looks good, but geez, I nearly had to start again, bringing up all the lines again. But I could see them underneath. I left enough so I could see. So that brought me up to the point where I had all the linear work finished. I'd love the viewer to stand in front of it and enjoy the painting and wonder who is this wonderful, smiling, radiant person and to go and find out more about Dr. Marie Maynard Daly. If people are standing in front of this painting in DCU and looking up, I imagine it's going to be hanging, that they will see a, a woman, a leader in science, a huge achiever, a activist, a person who is not dusted down from an ancient picture in the National Gallery, but that is, looks like they could be a living, breathing person. It's not just about the painting. I want the message to come across and I want to invoke a reaction in people and inspire them. So what I hope with this painting is that when somebody sees it, they go, who is that? What are they doing? What are all those people looking at? When they see this painting, I think, they'll realise it's not just a painting, it's an attempt to put history in proper perspective and the history of women, and history of women's achievements in proper perspective. That's the point of Women on Walls. We need to find out about the people who have been absent from her walls up to now.
Well, hello everyone and welcome to this very, very special conversation on the Women and in Walls initiative at DCU Hub. My name is Derva MacDonald and I'm delighted to join you for the launch of this, the third Accenture Women and Walls initiative, this time at DCU, my alma mater. And I'm a very, very proud graduate today to be involved in this conversation. Now, as you all know, DCU, amongst many other things, has an international reputation for excellence in science, computing and the engineering disciplines. And this particular campaign seeks to enhance the visibility of female trailblazers in STEM. Inspiring young people to make an impact in society is central to the Accenture Women and Walls Initiative at DCU. It all began in February 2020 when an open call submission went out to portrait artists throughout Ireland. Over 57 submissions were received from which just five artists were selected. And today I am delighted to be joined by those five commissioned artists. And let me introduce you to them. They are Una Seeley, Jim Fitzpatrick, Jackie Hudson Lawler, Breed Higgins Nikaneda, and Blaze Smith. So listen, you're all very, very welcome. Give us a give us a little hello. Um, and listen, first of all, congratulations to each and every one of you on these commissions. It's absolutely fantastic. And I, I'm going to get around to each and every one of you, but I'm going to start with you, Jim Fitzpatrick. Um, you're fascinated by these um, amazing women, um, both both living and and who have since uh, passed on. You were really, really attracted to your subject, who is Kay McNulty. Why don't you introduce us to her and tell us why you were so intrigued by this lady? The wonderful thing about it is this is an extraordinary woman. She was uh, her official civil service title was literally computer. Right. So there was a secretary, but this was a different kind of secretary. This was one who was involved right at the high end of everything. And she was, just, by the sounds of things, a mathematical genius. And again, it brings me back to my own upbringing. Uh, <clears throat> my first, one of my very close cousins is uh, Ethan McLeish, the geneticist. And I was brought up by her grand aunt who educated me because my mother was a working mother. So all these influences kicked into this extraordinary woman. So it became a very personal little story as well, you know. And every time I look at it, and the painting is over there looking at me, <clears throat> I kind of think, have I done her justice? And it's nothing to do with the commission. It's nothing to do with any, you know, whether people like it or not. I kind of want to look at it through her eyes. And I've spoken to her daughter as well. And the only thing I'm afraid of in this entire process is her daughter will look at it and go, it doesn't look like my mother. <laughs> but I think... Yeah, I think it does. But long story cut short, this is a woman who was involved with US military and hired during the Second World War, which is probably one of the few justifiable wars we could think of, the war against fascism. And she was involved in ballistics and she was also involved with the very first computers. I wrote it, <clears throat> I wrote it down called ENIAC. And that means electronic numerical integrator and computer. And that was literally the very first computer. Now, we know Alan Turing was doing all the Enigma stuff over in England. But in America, this was groundbreaking. And it meant, ballistically, that you could make a target and work out your trigonomics and mathematics and land it on the person's head, quite literally. And the idea was, A, to save ammunition, B, not to kill civilians. So there was a lot of important work being done in a very masculine area. It's as simple as that. And she was at the forefront of it. She wasn't just somebody in the background and someone to be immensely proud of. She came, her father was in the IRA, by the way, and it was jailed in Derry, right? And they were all Irish speakers from Donegal. <clears throat> I think she came from seven. I know she had five kids. I deal with one of them, Ginny. And every time I read about her and every time I work on this, I kind of work with a smile on my face. I don't know why. She just seems a very energetic interesting woman that I would have loved to have sat down with and say how did you do all that you know. Thank you Jim. I want to go next to Jackie Hudson Lawler because Jackie I know this was a very very important project for you. This is of course Catherine um, Johnson who sadly passed away in February last year at the ripe old age of 101. I think it was just three years after receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama and um, again involved in Apollo 11 that, that drew you to Catherine G. Johnson. I saw the film um, when it came out, Hidden Figures, and I just thought it was the most extraordinary story that 
for all of these years that, that nobody knew about these women, uh, not just Catherine, but there was a whole wing of black women, African-American women who were similar to, to Jim's story, they were called computers and skirts. They reckoned that the that male uh, engineers, they, they didn't have the patience to do all these calculations, which were done by hand at the time. So these ladies were employed to do that. And various engineers would come up and say, oh, I need a lady to do, you know, the calculations for this or that. And just a few weeks after Catherine started there, she was brought in um, to, at the time it was NACA rather than NASA, and they were more concerned with flight um, and working out, you know, problems mathematically to do with, with that. And uh, they never gave her back to the wing then, they held on to her. Was that good? <laughs> I want to uh, introduce you through the lady that um, did her portrait to our subject, who is Kathleen Lonsdale. Una Seeley, normally um, in life, you paint from life. So this was quite a, a different experience for you. Yeah, very different. Um, I do I do normally paint in the presence of my subject. So um, what I found with this different situation was that the research actually became uh, an equal part really of the process as the actual uh, painting of the piece. So what I had to do was make it, I wanted to make it as much as close to if Kathleen Lonsdale was sitting in the same room as me as possible. So I basically fabricated a, a stage set uh, that I took, that I referenced from um, what would have been her office in University College London, where she was the first tenured, tenured female professor. Uh, she, she was professor of um, chemistry in University College London. Um, and I populated the, the stage set with items that would have been associated with her, her career which was, although she was a groundbreaking scientist, she discovered the molecular structure of the benzene ring. She was a crystallographer. Um, she was the first, uh, the joint first woman member of the Royal Institute. Uh, so she has, she had so many accolades to her name, but an, an equal strand in her life was that she was a very committed pacifist. So um, all her scientific, it, became, it was one of her, her great grievances actually that uh, scientific advances became used for uh, warlike purposes. And um, I was actually very lucky. She went to jail at one point, didn't she? She was, she actually went to jail, um, I think, was, was it Holloway prison she ended up in because of this very strong pacifistic stance that she took? She, she at this point, she was a young mother with three children in the Second World War and um, women were required to do civil defense duties and she refused and was taken to court and fined two pounds or something and refused to pay it. And so she was sent to Holloway prison for, and she did five weeks in Holloway prison. And which was what became very typical of Kathleen Lonsdale. She then became a prison reformer after that as well. So she was then not only a scientist, a pacifist, but then she was a prison reformer for the rest of her life as well. I want to go to Breed because you must have been listening with envy to Una going, you had what? You had all of this, you had all of that direct contact. You had very, very little, but what little you did have played a huge part in your painting in terms of the technical detail. And I was wondering, just from what limited information you had, can you just explain, because the others haven't seen it just yet, how you incorporate that, uh, that into your depiction of Marie Menard Dilly? Well, because I had so few details about um, Dr. Daly's life, I tried to use all the details I had. Um, so for example, um, the, the small details I, I had knowledge of, I used those to inform things like um, colors, the set, um, the kind of atmosphere of the painting. Um, one of the things was that her father was um, from Jamaica and he came over to the United States um, with, a, with a scholarship to study chemistry himself. Um, but because of lack of funds, he couldn't continue these studies um, and he became a bus driver in Queens, but he supported his daughter all the way because she showed an aptitude um, for science. And also um, in trying to figure out the clothing that I would depict 
um, on Marie Maynard Daly in the portrait, I chose a color that I thought was significant. So I had a black and white photograph of her head and shoulders to work from. Um, and I used a model um, to kind of create the rest of the figure that I would also work from because I wanted to paint her hands. So I had to figure out what would she wear on the bottom half of her body. So I, I, I looked at skirts from kind of the mid 40s to the early 50s and the kind of style of clothing that would be used. And I decided to use the color green and black um, because she's wearing gold jewelry. So I used the color green, the colors green, black, white and gold because um, they're the Jamaican colors. Now it's very subtle. I don't, I didn't, I don't like, I didn't want to put flags in there, but I had to choose some color because everything was in black and white. So that's why I chose the green and the black. And I got a, a pattern printed on a piece of fabric which showed the hexagons and uh, pentagrams of, um, well, it's, it's uh, the yeah. molecular proteins that she worked on. She depicted them with um, hexagons and pentagons. So I used a pattern. I made a pattern of these hexagons and pentagons and printed them on a green ground and got this printed fabric, wrapped it around my model um, and painted it. So those are the kind of details I brought in. I mean, there are others, but I just tried to kind of really uh, use those little tidbits of information I had to inform the painting. Okay, can I just bring Blaze back in there? Because Blaze, you actually did have a previous exposure to women on walls, creating what in itself has now become quite an iconic image of those eight vibrant, but very, very much alive <laughs> uh, young uh, women in STEM. And I wanted to see what, because a little bit like Una, you, you know, you normally paint from life. So what was it like going and having a relationship with this posthumous subject that you had to, to bring to life? Well, again, I was uh, like Breed, a bit unlucky. There were no children, no really very, I had three pages of biographical information to work from. So that was tricky. Um, so in a way, uh, it's it's a fiction, what I, I, I have made as a painting, you know, uh, but I, um, uh, so my aim is much more to uh, make a painting that uh, people go, who is that person? What, are, what is it? And let them go and find out as much as they can about her and, and to draw attention to her, you know, to her. It's just to try and make a really interesting image first and foremost. And then, you know, these, I should say, we haven't really mentioned it. These are very big paintings. So, you know, there's a, from a painter's point of view, I'm sure we've all had to deal in different ways with just, just making the thing, you know, as well as organizing the image. What was your process, Blaze? How did you go about that? I know that that you had, whilst you didn't have huge material, you did have some video that you were able to pull together and, and have a look at. What was your process for, for well, bringing that big picture together? Well, I was looking a lot at footage, obviously, of the uh, space race and so on, and uh, uh, in the 60s and so on. Uh, what was really notable with a lot of it was the um, lack of women in the footage. You know, you can watch the whole Apollo 11 film, as I say, it's on Netflix. And I think for basically an hour and a half, you never see any women at all. So it's, you know, so it's like rugby on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> As an alien looking in at this footage at the time would, would have been really uh, wondering, you know, who the occasional strange creatures with the longer hair were that appeared. While we're here making paintings of women, which is a really important thing, there's a huge acculturation that has been going on for centuries, for millennia, in fact. You have a long way to go here, you know, really, you know, and, and you can change the pictures, but it's, it's um, you know, there's a massive uh, cultural change needed. Uh, you know. And I just want to go to you, Jim, there, you know, I know that you're, th the voice of your mother was channeled very much uh, through your mind when you were going through this process, but what was your own process and what sense of, um, what sense of obligation do you feel when you receive a commission like this and when you received this particular commission to paint Kay McNulty? I think you have a certain amount of responsibility. <clears throat> In a way, you're correcting the past. You're correcting the mistakes of the past. You're correcting 
the way women have kind of vanished into oblivion. And in the case of Kay McNulty, at one point when men and grandees and generals would visit the facilities, herself and the other computers, the most intelligent people in the room, would have to act as hostesses. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go back historically to the role of women in society from Victorian Ireland onwards, because before that it was the famine, you're talking about a very changed society. And you're talking about a society that was virtually oblivious to the role of women, to the point where when we got independence, the women fighters were written out of history virtually. We know they didn't even get pensions when the men did. So there's a historical anomaly to correct in a way in your own mind, and you bring it into this process as well. I'm well aware of the reason for the process. For instance, Blaise painted a wonderful picture for uh, the Royal Irish Academy, including my cousin, Eva McLeisett. And these are all people being recognized today. They're young Irish women. We're painting the past and we have a responsibility to bring these people to life. And someone like Kay McNulty is a fantastic person. You have to remember, she had five children. When she came to America, she didn't speak English. She spoke Gaelic. So there's a whole transition from coming from Donegal, from the Gaeltacht, to Philadelphia, where they lived, to going into the US military with this extraordinary aptitude for mathematics. The good news is in 1997, <clears throat> she was given the Women in Technology Award, which is a brand new award designed to show that women were actually behind a lot of the great technical achievements. So she did, she was recognized, you might say, in her own lifetime, which is wonderful, because she went from being a top scientist, she married the inventor of the ENIAC computer, Mauchi, and I think she had five children with him, and then she married Antonelli, she became Mrs. Antonelli, and adopted his two children as well. What kind of woman can do that? And by all accounts, she was a, a force of nature, according to her daughter. So this is an extraordinary woman and mother, and it's worth recognizing they can both work in tandem nowadays, much better than they could back then. They were totally separated. A woman had her place in the home. And I think this was suggested to her at some point as well. We won't go into that too much. One of her husbands put his foot in it. <laughs> <laughs> and no doubt she had a fantastic answer for that. I want to but go back to you. Pick up knitting, I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to you, Jackie uh, Lawler Hudson, because in terms of your process, normally you don't do research. You're, it's, it's something that, you know, a vision, the picture comes to mind, you go and do that. And yet for this process, you, you had to um, engage with research and engage with your subject in order to do that. So what was your process? How did you go about doing that? And how did you interact with Catherine G. Johnson? Uh, well, normally, as I said, yes, um, I have an idea for a painting of my own work and the image will come to me whole. But for this, I didn't know Catherine. I'd never met her. Um, so I had to go through that process of trying to get to know her so that I could portray her um, in a way that was true to herself, too. Um, I felt I, it was absolutely integral to, to the whole piece. And I think as well, um, I think it, it 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 wouldn't have been half as good if I just had gone with the image rather than the things that I've learned from her. Um, when we put the submission in, we really kind of had to ration, rationale every aspect to the painting, um, you know, from the clothing um, to the background colours, as Breed said, you know, we, we had to make those choices. Uh, and, and research was a way of achieving those choices. What, because I'm always intrigued, uh, not being an artist myself, but I, I'm always intrigued, what's the process, Jackie, that you have with it? If something you said, what you learned from her, and immediately it just kind of brought this image of almost, because portraiture, I imagine, is, is quite a deeply intimate uh, process in respect. When you say you learned from her, did you, did you feel that you were really channeling her as you were doing this huge obligation to, to, to bring her to life and to honour all that she had achieved? Yeah, I, I think once you start to work, um, you go deeper. Whatever research you've done, when you're actually painting and looking very closely at these elements, you do go deeper. 
But artists think are lucky to be very, very strong imaginations. And I think I would say that we all developed an imaginary relationship with our subjects. Um, I know myself, um, there were days I spoke to Catherine, you know, I apologised for something I'd got very, very badly wrong. And, um, you know, I would come on, Catherine, work with me here and I hope you like this, you know. So um, so you, I, think, I think that's what we bring of ourselves to painting, not only our, our experience as painters and, you know, the technical aspects. Um, it, it, it is that imaginative quality of having an imaginative relationship. Blaze, I wanted to come back to you because part of the Accenture Women on Walls initiative is, as Jim said about it, it's about righting wrongs, correcting history, but it's also about answering those unanswered questions um, in history about these women, about their achievements. When people come to see the portrait that you have done of Beatrice Alice Hicks, what are the questions that you think they will ask or that you hope they will ask when they see this? I think the most important um function of a portrait for for me anyway is that uh when somebody sees the painting they go who is that and you know why is there a big painting of them and so the image should have some kind of uh open-ended questions in it that make you go you know what are the, what are the, what are they doing you know what what's what's it about them so in my particular painting you know uh, she is standing amongst a group of men, and uh, but she's very much uh, sort of dominant in the image and looks strong. And I think it's very important that people, you know, this is going to be presumably hung in a crowded university, and you're going to have all kinds of, uh, you know, young people and indeed lecturers and all sorts of people, I suppose, going along those corridors. And I hope that in my painting's case, people will go, who is she? What's what, what's that about? You know, and they will, you know, be immediately curious looking at it as to, you know, what's going on there. And that will draw them in. And because, you know, there's only so much information you can give, you know, in any image, you know, but they have to be little cues, if you know what I mean, to set up uh, a dialogue between the viewer and the um, and the painting itself, you know? So that's what I was trying to achieve with mine and uh, I hope it does that. Absolutely. I wanted to go back to you, um, Breed, because obviously this was huge gravitas for you in terms of being your first public commission, but I know you also felt a, felt a deep sense of gravitas towards, towards your subject. And that, I suppose that um, obligation, you know, that you had to, to portray her gravitas and, and her achievements. But can you speak a little bit to that, what it was like kind of trying to, that, that I suppose the momentous task of, of doing that? I suppose people who have achieved a huge amount in um, science and mathematics and so on kind of dazzle me because I just know <laughs> that no matter how much effort, if I tried my whole life, I would never be able to do something like that. So I'm always a little bit fascinated uh, by, by things that are, are different from my own sphere of understanding. Um, and, but at the same time, there's a bit of pressure because you have to try and understand it a little bit to, to depict it. But I suppose having a painting on a university wall and a painting of someone who's achieved a lot is, like Jim already says, there is a, a, a responsibility and you want to give them the kind of, uh, you want to imbue it with a bit of importance. Um, and so in my case, I very much felt that the figure had to be uh, at the at the very foreground of the painting and that while there were other details I mean you know there has to be some bit of detail because there's so much space um, but I very much wanted to to put the the figure at the foreground so that there's no doubt as to that this is a, a portrait of an important person and not just a painting of um, a woman in a lab for example. Can I ask um, Jackie um, you know I suppose because you know uh, Catherine G. Johnson's death is, is so recent, you know, compared to the other posthumous um, subjects. But how does it feel as an artist to be um, in your own way, um, part of her life story, part of telling her story? Uh, because it seems to me, speaking to you all, that these women have profoundly impacted you individually as artists and as, and as much as anything else. It's a huge privilege um, to be 
in any way associated. I mean, when I first saw that film a couple of years ago, if you had told me then that I was going to paint, you know, have a commission, to, like I could have paint her, painted her at any time, but to have a commission, official commission um, to paint her, I, I just wouldn't have believed you. You know, it is a huge, huge privilege as an artist to be in any way um, associated with such a genius, absolutely. And I wanted to ask Una because you know you also mentioned your grandmother and um, and I mean channeling her fabulous her as I as I as I speak from your your very animated description but you very 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 much wanted to be part of a project that was making women visible. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it was. It, I'm just so conscious of that we as artists are a conduit for huge achievements of women in the past and that they, we are now bringing that legacy to, uh, to present day students and staff at a national institution. And through this Women on Walls project as well, it has got much wider uh, ramifications because of the, the fact that it's part of an ongoing project and that it has really brought the whole issue into the public awareness. Um, I think you know this is the third year, third iteration of it. Um, I've certainly been following it really in, in real interest since the Royal Irish Academy one. And it, it you know, it's as somebody who um, you, you're just these men in suits, portraits, men in robes, men in chains, everywhere. I, you know, you don't even sometimes you just don't even see them anymore. So um, this is these are really exciting and the fact that there is five very different artists chosen for this project and that the paintings are um we have painted them as far as i can gather from all the descriptions in quite a contemporary style which i think will make it very accessible for the the uh the contemporary people who are going to be looking at them and then hopefully this will be an inspiration and ultimately uh, you know, when all is said and done, the painting, it's all about the painting. Is it a good painting? Blaise, I was struck by something you just said earlier, um, you know, about this being part of a much, much bigger project. In my own head, I have so many institutions, I have so many professions, including my own, that I would love to see the Accenture Women on Walls treatment of. But um, your own sense of, you know, where this goes next and, and the role of the artistic community in in really sort of, um, you know, bringing this project forward. I think it's very interesting how much debate there's been just lately uh, and controversy about portraits. I'm particularly talking about the statues that have been torn down in various cities. And what that says is that portraits and images of people are important and they have, uh, they have a very special message and they still have potency. So making uh, portraits of people has a, you know has a similar effect going in the opposite direction. Do you know what I mean? It, it has a you are making a statement, and you know for Accenture and and uh, Business to Arts and DCU to get together and do this, you know, is a you know it's a statement. Basically, it's a very positive statement in in favor of of, of uh, women. You know, um, but also you know there is quite a lot of stuff swirling around uh, public images of prominent people you know and who should be uh, portrayed and what what's all that about now i'm not going to answer any of those questions of course i'm just saying it's well, great that, that to be is. given the opportunity it's that, great to be given the opportunity and a huge honor to take part in that discourse so, you know, that, that's that, absolutely fantastic. i think you're completely correct because that whole issue of images what should be retained what should be destroyed everything is is so current and it's probably the subject of an entirely different seminar which sadly I don't have the time for today but before I let you go I want to ask each and every one of you and I'm going to start with you Una if your subject was here with you today what would you like to say to her I'd like to ask her how she did it how she, um, because as, a, as a, a woman and mother of children as well, I know how hard it is these days, even with all the supports that we have now that they didn't have then, how, how hard it is to, to, you know, to achieve the top of your game 
um, because when you have all those other responsibilities as well. And so how did she manage to do that in the 1940s um, with just that utter determination when she was the only person in the room who was a woman? And, um, and I just would be fascinated to find out what her driving force was when everything was against her. Jackie, uh, Catherine G. Johnson was in the room. What would you say to her? I would say thank you for being um, such uh, an inspiration and for fighting so hard in a time of segregation in America for her education and um, for her, her will to push herself through, to place herself in a position where she could make the most of her talent. Um, and also thank you for um, the work she did on air safety in terms of every plane flying today. Um, and definitely thank you for what she's done for me in terms of my growth through this process. Um, I really learned so much in terms of research and painting such a big picture and yeah, no, thank you. Please, apart from interrogating uh, Beatrice Alice Hicks to the hilt about Apollo 11, what, um, <laughs> what, would, what, what would you say to her or what, would you, what, what question would you have for her? Uh, what do you think? That'll be the main question. What do you think of the painting? Like, <laughs> what do you think? Because, um, well, I just hope she'd like it, you know? I mean, that's, that's really, you know, it's a, a really tricky moment when you have a person coming in to see their portrait, even if, and, and actually, look, normally when I paint people, uh, they're in the room with me, they're seeing each day's work as it proceeds, it's very useful, you know, whereas she'd just be walking and just seeing it just full on. Yeah. There you go. What do you what do you think? <laughs> like very stressful moment, actually. I was going to so, say I wait with bated breath for the response. Yes. Um Breed, Marie Menard Daly, uh, and I know that you you felt you'd scant details perhaps in comparison to your your fellow commissioned artists, but what would be the kind of one of the key things you would like to ask her or say to her? I'd like to ask her whether she's pleased that uh, her portrait is now going to be in a very diverse uh, and vibrant university as someone who I mean, we're painting pictures to honor um, uh, these uh, famous women of achievement, but she put her money where her mouth was and she uh, made financial contributions for uh, students of color to achieve in the area of chemistry. Um, and I'd like her to see her portrait in DCU and to find out what she thinks about uh, the changes in kind of the makeup of a student cohort and indeed a university cohort. Jim Fitzpatrick finally from, from Che to K. It's quite a, it's quite a, a journey, um, I, but I know you were particularly captivated by Kay McNulty. So, um, what would you want to speak to her? I think I would be very apprehensive. <clears throat> She's a woman who knew her own mind. And I could imagine her walking into this room where the painting will be with me standing there. And I would be extraordinarily nervous because her daughter's words would be echoing and also <laughs> her dialogue that you sustain over, I, I've been working on this two months. The person becomes alive. And you can imagine them looking at the portrait and going, oh, that eye looks a bit odd. <laughs> and these are the things you worry about when you're dealing with live people, <clears throat> but you can correct. With somebody who is not here with us, all you want to do, I think, the bottom line is to do them justice so that when people see this painting, hopefully they'll regard it as a work of art like all of our work, but they will see something in it that draws them to the person. But more than that, I wanted to represent her in a way that she would be proud of, not just me. So it's a, you're, you're balancing, it's a balancing act all the time between the inner dialogue, which you think is coming from the person because you've become so deeply entrenched and immersed in the person, and your attempt to artistically record her in a way that would almost, I suppose, please her. I don't care about anybody else, but. I know her daughter, when you know she sees the final picture, will go, you got her. 
that I would love to hear that. May not happen. Okay, well, look, that's all we have time for today. All that remains for me to do is to thank each of our artists, Jim, Bree, Jackie, Una and Blaze. Thank you so much for sharing your process and for also sharing the amazing backstories of these fantastic women and trailblazers in STEM. This is only the beginning of a year long program at DCU and for those of you who are interested in finding out more, you will be able to access the information on the Women and Walls at DCU Hub Initiative on the credits that will fall shortly below just after we finish up. There will also be more information there on each of our artists here today, their subjects and so much more besides. So thank you very, very much for joining us in this amazing conversation for Accenture's Women and Walls at DCU. Thank you.